Uh, resume recording. Okay, so good evening all. Um, this evening session we're going to be looking at secondary ports. It's I think week, gosh, I think week twelve or thirteen of the of doing these free online sessions. Um, part of our training bites online. The session is going to be recorded so that we can pop it up onto the uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, who are new to the sessions, very you know you're very welcome. I'm Kath Scott. I'm the chief instructor here at Compass C School. I'm an advanced private instructor. Um, a yachtmaster instructor power. Um, I'm also a lifeboat trainer assessor on the RNL library here in Porter's Head. Okay, so uh, what are we going to have a look at this evening? Well, we're going to take a look at um, what the almanac actually shows us. Um, let me just grab my spotlight. There we go. Uh, what the almanac actually shows us from a standard port entry and a secondary port entry, and why there are needs for secondary ports at all. Um, what data we will find in the almanac and then how we interpret that secondary port data um, and how we calculate high water and um, low water times and heights using the secondary port um, calculations and a few alternative methods for you. So what I'm going to be doing this evening is probably the most traditional of uh, ways of doing secondary ports. There are lots of other ways. It is quite mathematical. So there are many different ways of putting the number lines together. Um, and hopefully I'll cover a couple of those in the alternative methods as well. Okay, so first up then, let's start with why is it important? Well, for a start of a 10, we'd quite like to go sailing somewhere different. We don't just want to sail from standard port to standard port. Um, and these are extracts from the RYA training almanac. I've just chosen a particular point. This is Parvin Sound. Um, Parvin Sound is a secondary port. And the most important thing to understand is if that's the case, where is its standard port? So every standard port has a collection of secondary ports that belong to it. And in this instance, this is the extract here. Uh, Parvin Sound is the secondary port and the standard port there is Port Fraser. And the most important thing you'll see about this little arrow is it tells you which way to go in the book, in the almanac, to find that standard port. So it tells you whether, so if it's pointing left, you're going to go backwards in the book. If it's pointing right, you're going to be going forwards in the book. Okay, so that's a top tip for you if you've ever wondered why the little arrow is there. Effectively, what's the difference with the secondary ports then? The secondary port doesn't have an entire tidal um, year um, against it. So whereas all the standard ports will give you uh, January through to December and they will give you every day of the year and they will give you the tides, the high water times and low water times and heights, um, the secondary ports wouldn't. Because if they did, the book would be mahusive and actually reads as big enough as it is. So what it does give you, there is an ability to calculate it using the standard port data. OK, you'll also get a little bit of a description and there'll be some interesting bits about navigation and there'll probably even be a little chartlet in there as well. Um, and tonight, the example that we're going to use is we're going to pick up one of these moorings in St Anthony's Bay. And what we might want to do is moor up um, and work out what the clearance is that we would have under the keel. Um, packed over low water to make sure that we don't ground at low water. So secondary ports don't need to be particularly complicated and there are some real easy tips and tricks that you can use in order to get them working for you. Okay, so where do we get the information from? You've got a couple of or four different examples here and what I want you to take a look at is the setup of them all is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter on the, the port, it says the standard port is Victoria for this top one here. We've got some high water information, we've got some low water information and then we've got some tidal height information. Okay, And that's, every, that's the same in all of the entries. Okay, But what you will notice is that sometimes these hours are different. So here at the top left we've got high water going from midnight to six o'clock to twelve o'clock to eighteen hundred. Whereas down here, we've got it going from one o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock to one o'clock to seven o'clock. So there are different entries, but that doesn't matter as long as you use the method that I'm going to show you to work out what the calculation will be. Okay? But for each one of these, you'll see that it gives you an idea of where the standard port is. It shows you the arrows. So we've got two on the left going left and the two on the right going right um, and sometimes there will be more than one secondary port listed on the page so over here we've got that the standard port is Namley Harbour but we're in Itchingham and Emsbourne which just happens to be part of um, 
the RYA chart three, and you'll see that we've got the differences for H and M and the differences for M is born as well. Okay, so how do we actually use that information? Well, <clears throat> here are some real ones, if you like. So real out of the Reeds Western Almanac, just to give you an idea of how complicated it can start to look. On the right hand side here, I've got the entry for Portis Head, which is where we are in the world. Um, I've also got lots of differences for Portis Head, for Clevedon, for St. Thomas's Head, English and Welsh, Western Supermare. So actually, it's not just about one or two, you can have a number of these okay but what's interesting is when we start looking at some of these numbers they're going to get quite large and here we'll see we've got high water going from two to six two to eight sorry two to eight and three to eight so <clears throat> there are slightly different ways of writing this information and it's all to do with the harmonics of the tide and when the low waters and when the high waters tend to be most importantly, I want you to take a look down here at Western Supermare. Okay? So Western Supermare has a high water difference between 20 minutes and 30 minutes earlier than Bristol. But actually, if we look here, this is one of the things that seems to trip my students up all the time. This says that it's 130. Okay, It's not 130 minutes, it's one hour 30. Okay, So when we're doing the calculation, it's important that you understand that that is telling you in hours. So one hour 30. Similarly, if we hop over to the left hand side here, we've got some even more extreme figures where we look at the difference between uh, Bridgewater and from Avonmouth. And if you look at the low water, the low water can vary up to three hours or nearly five hours different. OK, equally, what I've got here is some big differences in height. So actually, when we take a quick look at Bridgewater, it could be around about eight metres different. So in that instance, it's really important that we can work out what the differences are, particularly if we want to go anchor and make sure that we don't run aground or if we're entering somewhere where we need to work out a tidal height to get over a bar or over a seal or something like that. So top tips, okay, the arrow is the first top tip for the evening, it tells you which way to go in the book and also these are done in hours, okay, so it's not 305 minutes, it's three hours and five minutes, okay. So how does it work? Well, First up, we need to go and get the information that we're going to look at. So we're going to be anchoring in St Anthony's Bay, which is in Parvin Sound. So I need to go to the entry in my almanac, which gives me this data around Parvin Sound. Okay. So first up, when I look at it, what I'm going to say is, well, let's take a look at the high water for a starter for 10. This means that the most it can change is 48 minutes earlier the least it can change is 24 minutes earlier. So when we do our calculations, it's always going to be at least 24 minutes earlier than our Port Fraser high water, okay? Similarly with the low water time then, it's going to vary between 20 minutes earlier and 46 minutes earlier, okay? So the least it's going to change is 20 minutes, the most it's going to change is 46 minutes. And when we look at our heights over here, they're not changing a great deal, but we've got the difference between minus 0.3 and plus one, and then we've got plus 0.6 to the low water to plus three. Okay, all will become clear as to how these fit into your calculations. So the very first thing that we need to do is we need to go to our almanac, and we need to work out when our high water is at our standard port. So high water at Port Fraser for this particular day, I just chose a day at random, it really doesn't matter, is at 2.30 UT, okay? So uh, where does 2.30 fit within this grid, okay? So is it between zero and six? Is it between 12 and six? Well, it fits somewhere in here, okay? So I'm going to be using the calculation going from midnight up to six o'clock. I'm going to be using the differences going from minus 48 to minus 24. And top tip, if you can, blank out the rest of this when you're doing your calculations and just look at, that's why I put the circle around it here, square around it, just look at those high water times, okay? So I'm interested in between zero and six o'clock and this is where I start to draw my um, sawtooth. So I start with drawing a triangle, okay? 
And again, do you think it has to be super, super accurate? Okay, you can draw this freehand. And most of the time when I do this session, I just draw it on the board. Okay, so I just draw this freehand. And actually, I just split this nicely up into six. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I am interested in this bit here. So I'm going to put zero, 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 zero. So midnight at one end of my triangle and six o'clock at the other end of my triangle. And then it stands to reason that three o'clock would be in the middle, okay? Now what I need to do is remember that I read down these columns. So where I've got my midnight, what I need to do is make sure that that tallies with 48 minutes difference and that my six o'clock tallies with my 24 minutes difference. So I label the top of my triangle here with 48 here, and 24 there. So the zero belongs to the 48, the six o'clock belongs to the minus 24, okay? It doesn't matter that they're not a traditional number line reading from left to right. What's important is that you match the numbers. So zero matches 48, six, uh, zero 600 matches 24, okay? And I leave the minus in there because I want to make sure that I know whether I'm subtracting or whether I'm adding. So now the most important thing I do on here is I draw the line on the end of my triangle. And once I've drawn the line on the end of my triangle, then when I try and use this to calculate anything, I have to make sure that the line I use is perpendicular to that line. Okay, parallel to, sorry, not even perpendicular. So I'm going to draw a line. Let me just grab a blue line. Okay, so I'm going to draw a line that is pretty much parallel to the other line and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it. So my high water is at 2.30 at Port Fraser so I'm going to move this line down until it sits at 2.30. Okay so these lines are parallel and usually I would just use my plotter and I would just roll my plotter down the triangle. So what I've got now is that it's sitting here and it's crossing this timeline at two, about 2.30. Okay, so this would be one o'clock, two o'clock, 2.30. So now I need to work out what does that mean up here? I can either do it by eye, I can start measuring things if I really want to, <clears throat> but let's do it by eye. I've worked out that there's what, 12 minutes difference between the end and the middle. So six minutes is gonna be about here-ish. So actually that's probably only going to be about two minutes difference. So I reckon it's going to be about minus 38. Okay, because it's going down that number line. <clears throat> so I can say my high water difference is 38 minutes difference. So what does that mean for my new high water at Parvin Sound? I simply subtract my 38 from 0 to 30 and I get 0, 0152. Okay, so just to recap. We match the numbers, we read down these columns. So my zero goes to 48, my six goes to 24. And if you drew this and you wanted to draw it out in centimeters or, or whatever your, your units were, it doesn't matter if it goes all the way past here, because when you draw that line on that joins the dots at the end, this line here is always going to be parallel to it. So you could have a really long triangle if you wanted to, okay? But I try and get students to get out of the habit of feeling that they need to draw it on graph paper, okay? We're working things out roughly here, all right? Because we don't sail to within the minute, neither do we sail to within the point one, uh, really, of a, uh, in height. So we're trying to work it out roughly, okay? So you need to think, what kind of person are you? Are they the kind of person who absolutely wants to get the graph paper out and draw it all properly? Then, yeah, that's fine but it will take you a long time to do it. And this needs to be able to be done quite quickly and done on the hoof. So this is how I recalculate my high water time now. So there I've got a new high water time of 0152. And you'll notice that I'm in UT, so I'm in universal time. When we're dealing with daylight saving time, which we'll do in the next example, that's a slightly different calculation. Okay, so these are all in UT. So I've got my high water time. What I now want to do is to say, okay, so what's the difference then for my high water height? So from my almanac I've looked at today, high water at Port Fraser is 3.6. And now what I'm interested in is the calculations that sit within this red box here. Okay. Now, 
these aren't quite so great, but what it says is that if my high water is 4.2, then the difference is minus 0 0.3. If my high water is 3.4, the difference is plus 0 0.1. So I can create another triangle, put my triangle down here to calculate my high water heights. On the bottom here, I have put the heights here. So 4.2 all the way to 3.4. Again, it doesn't matter that they're reading the wrong way because what I'm going to do is tally it with not minus 0 0.3 up to plus 0 0.1. OK, so 4.2 minus 0 0.3 are together. And then when I put my line in, the 3.4 joins up to plus 0.1, okay? So this time I'm gonna need to grab myself a red line and I'm going to draw it. And I'm going to draw my line parallel, there we go. So there's the line that I'm gonna use to move. And what I want to do is I want to move this line to my high water at Port Fraser at 3.6. So if I can grab the line, I'm gonna move it, keeping it nice and parallel. I'm going to pop it onto where the 3.6 is on the bottom of the scale here, and I'm going to see what it reads at the top. So in this instance, we've done an awful lot of calculations to find out that the difference is nothing, okay? But at least you know that now, okay? So the difference here is going from minus 0.3, minus 0.2, minus 0.1 to zero, and then plus 0.1. So the high water difference is zero. So my new high water at Parvin Sound is exactly the same as the one in Port Fraser. Okay. So we've done our high water height. We've done our high water time. If we're looking at creating a new tidal curve, what we also need now is our low water. So our low water at Port Fraser that we've looked up is 0.8. <clears throat> 0 0.8 sits within these two numbers here. Okay. So it sits somewhere in the middle-ish. Okay. These numbers you could probably do by eye because the change isn't very much, but I'm showing you the principle of how this works. So the green box goes around all of my low waters. So if the low water was 1.1, it would be dead easy. If I'd looked it up and it said low water today is 1.1, I wouldn't need to do any calculations with my triangles. I'd just be able to add 0.6. Similarly, if I'd looked it up and it was 0.4, I would just be able to add 0.3. But of course, that wouldn't be the best example to show you. So again, I draw my little triangle down here and I pop my heights here from 1.1 to 0.4. And then I match them up again. So remember, I'm looking down the columns. So I match my 1.1 with my plus 0.6. And if I pop the line on, you'll see here. So this one is slightly skewed, but it doesn't matter because it's all about being parallel to this particular line. <clears throat> so if I go grab a green line and put my line on parallel, okay, what I'm interested in here is my low water at Port Fraser is 0 0.8. So I need to move this line and pop it on where it crosses the 0 0.8 at the bottom here, okay? So this is quite a big scale at the top here. So what I'm going to say is, well, 0 0.8 is really near a 0 0.5. We're not going to get into tenths of centimetres or whatever. You know, I'm interested in it being 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. And in this instance, I'm going to say that my difference is going to be plus 0 0.5. So my new low water height for Parvin Sound is 1.3 metres. So now if I wanted to create my tidal curve for Parvin Sound, I go get the Port Fraser tidal curve, I pop these information, or this information onto it, and I can create my new one for uh, Parvin Sound, okay? Everybody with me so far? Okay, fab, there's some nods and there's some thumbs up, which is great, okay. So <clears throat> this is what it would look like. Here's my new information. This is the Port Fraser curve, okay? Let me just clear the drawings off for you. Okay, so this would be the Port Fraser curve. I've already started to put some of the information in. I've put my UT in here because it is UT rather than daylight saving. I've labeled up the curve with the new information. I've put my 3.6 up at the top here, my low water at Parvin Sound. But what's important now is that I cross out, let me grab a line, I cross out Port Fraser. OK, I cross out Port Fraser because actually this becomes the tidal curve for Parvin Sound 
on let's say the 1st of January and I also put that the times are in UT okay you know I've put UT down there this is just how I go about doing it so here are your top tips label everything okay if you've been on any of the sessions that we've done for our navigation you'll know that's my absolute mantra label everything okay so is it UT or BST let's keep it simple because some people prefer to work in UT even when it's summertime cross out the standard port and write the secondary port in there so when I look at this or perhaps I take over on watch from you I know that this is the curve for Parvin Sound on this particular day and that all the times are in UT. So make sure that you write the date on there, okay? They would be my top tips for how to create your tidal curve. What could we do now? Well, we could say if we were anchoring and we wanted to work out a height of tide, if we wanted to work out the height of tide at around four o'clock, we could go up to our curve, we could go across and we could do that and we could then go into all of our tidal calculations, okay? so that's the principle of how we do it and this was using it in ut okay so my next example if i go <clears throat> is we're looking to anchor at 1900 bst on the 3rd of may in st anthony's bay what clearance will there be um, at low water so first up then what do i need to do well, I need to go and make sure I've got the right information. So I go back to my almanac and I say, St. Anthony's Bay, differences of Parvin Sound, and I pop that on there, okay? I might circle it, but I'd certainly keep my almanac open at that page. Now, what do I need? Well, now I need to know it's the 3rd of May, so I need to go to Port Fraser, and I need to get the information from Port Fraser that says, <clears throat> on the 3rd of May, this is what your tide is doing, okay? So this is what the tide is doing. We're gonna be out at 1900 BST. <clears throat> What's my nearest low, uh, high water? My nearest high water is at 1600. But remember, this is in UT because it's written in the almanac. It's a non-shaded area. So this is where we need to worry about the time zones. I also want to know my range. So I'm going to subtract the range, okay? It's 3.5 minus one is gonna give me about 2.5 and that's a neeps day. And I know that from looking at my tidal curve, okay? So when I use my tidal curve, I'm going to be using the neap curve rather than the springs curve. So I do this information and then I make it really simple for myself. I create myself a grid, okay? Now, most of the time, we're only interested in three pieces of information for our tidal curves, which is the high water time, the high water height, and the low water height. If we were using a low water curve, and there are a few of those around, uh, we would need to do the low water time, but we're gonna focus on the high water time, the high water height, and the low water height for this one, okay? So my first line is my standard port data, and this is just me being organized and getting it down nice and neatly on the page. My next line is going to be for the differences, then I'm going to calculate my secondary port and then I'm going to do my time zone update. So all of this will be in UT, then I will work out my time zone update at the end. Okay, so it's similar numbers. Here's my high water time calculations then. What I'm interested in, oh, in fact I've got the wrong one on there, haven't I? I've got 1800 um, instead of I've got 90, 1900 BST on there. So 1900 BST would actually be 1800, okay? So I would be able to do the changes. I can also do my high water height, which is I'm looking at 3.5. I can also do my low water height where I'm looking at um, 0.8, okay? And remember, these are exactly the same triangles that I had on the previous page. I just need to make sure that I've got the right ones on there, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, pardon me. I might just change that time for you. Uh, bear with me a second. I just change that and pop up. I think we will do, we'll come up with a new time in a second. Bear with me a second. Okay. So, what we're going to take a look at then, I'm interested on Port Fraser as to where 1600 fits. Okay. So, 1600 here fits in between 1200 and 1800. So what I'm going to do is to say, I need to draw my line. So I'll go get myself a blue line. Um, I'm going to draw my line parallel. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out 
where it sits against Port Fraser. And I can move the line up and down. I can move the line to wherever I want it to be, okay? So if I've got 1600 in here, uh, let me just put my spotlight on, I can work out that that's gonna be a 32 minute difference. If I've got my high water height of 3.5, I can work out that actually that's going to be about 0 0.1. If I've got my low water height of 0 0.8, then I can work out on here by moving these lines up and down that I can get to plus 0 0.5, okay? So that's where I put my differences in and I write my differences as separate lines so that when I put my secondary port data, what I can actually do is to say, okay, so what does that mean? So 1600 minus my 32 minutes gives me 1528 UT, and you'll see I've still labeled it in UT. High water height 3.5 plus 0.1 will give me 3.6. My low water height 0.8 plus 0.5 will give me 1.3, okay? So that would ideally be it if I wanted to draw my tidal curve in UT but I don't, I want to draw it in BST this time around. So what I need to do is to do the time zone update. And because it's DST, uh, British Summertime Daylight Saving Time, I'm going to add one hour on, okay? So the three bits of information that I want to move onto my tidal curve then are 1628 becomes the new high water time, my high water height becomes 3.6, and my low water height becomes 1.3, okay? So, what does that look like? Well, here we have the Parvin sound curve. So I've crossed out the fact that it was the Port Fraser curve. I've labeled it with Parvin sound. I've put the date on there and I've put DST on there as well, okay? I've labeled my high water height. I've labeled my low water height and I've joined the dots. It's easiest to put a little dot around it and a dot there and then join the dots. And you'll see down here, I've labeled it in DST. So if I now wanted to work out what my height of tide was going to be at 1900, what I can actually do is use my curve. I can go 1900 up to the Neeps curve across there and say, okay, so that's going to be about 2.7 meters height of tide. I could then work out what the clearance would be under the curve, okay? So I've changed the port phrase curve. So there are no tidal curves for secondary ports, they're just for the standard ports. I need to go get the right standard port curve and then I need to change it, okay? So some of these you can do by eye. Like I said, when we have a look at the, um, the low water here, we've only got a difference between plus 0.6 and plus 0.3. So when we're looking at 0 0.8, we kind of know it's, in the middle-ish over to the left of this number line, if this was a number line. So we could have made a guess at plus 0.5. Same with the, the heights. So quite often it's easier to guess the heights, but I would tend to always do the longhand calculations for my um, hours, unless they're really easy ones to do, okay? So what are the alternative methods then? Well, the one at the top here is probably um, the most complicated. This is drawing a similar kind of triangle, but putting it all onto one particular grid. So you'll see here, this is going from uh, three o'clock, nine o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock, three o'clock. And it's almost drawing 24 hours. So it's sort of drawn the triangles, but it's put them on the sides. But it still made sure that it matched 300 with the right time and 300, uh, 1500 with the right time there. And it just means that I can read it slightly sideways and I'd be able to do the whole grid in one, okay? Personally, it's a little bit complicated for my liking. Um, I pretend to do just draw the freehand uh, triangles and just mark them off. What I can also do is go to something like Easy Tide. When I go to Easy Tide, I can use the predict um, select port and I can go and select a secondary port so I can go and get that information from easy time without doing the calculations, which is great if I have access to the internet and so on and so forth, okay? But I may well not have that. I can also use something like Navionics. This is a screenshot that I did earlier on off my Navionics. I've actually selected the port of Bristol. That happens to be a, sec a standard port, but the information for secondary ports would be the same. And what I get down here at the bottom is an idea of what that tidal curve would look like. And I can actually move this. I, you, 
you have to have it on the iPad to, to do it live, but I can actually move this up and down and I'd be able to work out for my secondary report as well. If I went to a secondary report, I could pick that data up. So there are lots of other places that you can get the data, but actually if you're looking at working through to your Yacht Master, we certainly do secondary reports on the Yacht Master because it's never a spring day or a neap day. And it also gets a little bit more confusing when we have to compute the tidal rates as well. So, but for this, the top tips, if I go back up to, bear with me a second, clear the drawings off. Here are my top tips, okay? So label everything, make sure you've picked up the right curve, that you're in UT or you're in BST, cross out the standard port and make sure um, that you've got uh, your secondary port written in there and then add the date on there. So make sure it's as, as correctly labeled as you can possibly get it, okay? Uh, there's my top tips, okay? This grid just makes me do it methodically, okay? So the way I put the grid on there, and it can be just a simple table, so your standard port, what the differences are, what the data is for your secondary port, and therefore what the time zone updates, because remember these were all written in UT, so if you're playing in daylight saving time, British summer time, in this instance, you're going to need to do that calculation at the end, okay? There's a high water triangle, there's a high water height triangle, there's a time triangle, a height triangle, and also I do my low water height triangle, okay? I calculate the differences against the information that I have got, so 1600 UT was what I was given, I work out that that's minus 32. That gives me my new high water time, which I can put onto my tidal curve. But actually, if I want to draw the tidal curve in watch time, if you like, so in a local time, I need to do that time zone update at the end, okay? Then I've got my three pieces of information of my, uh, my high water time, my high water height, and my low water height. I can pop them onto my curve and then I can go about doing my calculation to work out if I was going to anchor what the clearance would be at the low water or if I was trying to get into somewhere over a bar. Okay, so let's have a quick counter through. Uh, these are the objectives we've looked at tonight. So what the standard port and secondary port entries were, what, entry, what information we can find in the almanac, how we interpret the secondary port data, how we do the calculations and some alternative methods. Okay, so just before I go to the questions, oh, bear with me. Uh, next up, we have got Light Shapes and Sounds Week. So we did a very simple IRPCS about 10 weeks ago now. So I thought it might be interesting to have a go at Light Shapes and Sounds. Part one is on Tuesday at seven, part two is on Thursday. These are our free sessions. Part one, we're going to be covering some of the simple uh, lights and then part two we're going to cover some of the more complicated and more obscure lights but also we're going to bring in the shapes and sounds and we'll pop some restricted visibility in there as well and uh, we also have a paid session which is our weather workshop which is going to be a week on Saturday and that's a half day workshop where we have smaller numbers um, and much more interactions and we're going to look at the basics of weather they'll all be on the website this evening okay so that's the session if I just go up to the top here and 